Donald Davidson. I'm Mike King. Welcome to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Hall of Fame Museum for another edition of Indy 500, The Classics. But Donald, for a lot of reasons, 1977 was a big year, but certainly all eyes were on the cars as they took to the track for qualifying. Speeds were what we were looking for. As soon as the 1976 race was over, the entire track was resurfaced from start-finish line to start-finish line and allowed to sit through the whole winter. Nobody got out to test until the spring of 77, and Gordon Jowcock did an unofficial 200-mile-an-hour lap. So the big thing going into practice and qualifying in 1977 was, were we going to see 200 miles an hour? So another barrier waiting to be broken at the Brickyard. Let's take a look at qualifications for the 1977 Indianapolis 500. In 1911, Ray Haroon drove his Marmon Wasp over the finish line to win the inaugural Indianapolis 500. Exactly half a century later, Anthony Joseph Foyt Jr. of Houston, Texas also won the 500. He raced over the same bricks as Ray Haroon, but for him and his contemporaries, the contest was much shorter in time, at almost twice the speed. The following year, the ancient bricks in the main straightaway were paved over and speeds climbed. By 1964, the invasion of the European rear engine car was underway. A.J. Foyt, like others, tested the new speed concept, but on race day, preferred to drive the dependable roadster. It was a wise choice. He won for a second time. But it was the last time that a roadster would ever make the trip to Winter Circle. Nineteen sixty seven. The last lap of the race, it was a miracle that Foyt somehow threaded his way through the carnage of this final lap to claim his third victory. This made him a member of a very select group, three-time winners, Louis Meyer, Wilbur Shaw, and Maury Rose. But no one had ever won the 500 four times, and so it was entirely logical that A.J. Foyt, at age 32, should pursue a fourth unparalleled win. The roadsters disappeared, and veteran drivers learned to live with the new, faster rear-engine cars. In subsequent Memorial Day events, Foyt experienced frustration and disappointments. Wherever he raced, he was a strong competitor, winning a national reputation as a hard-driving, two-fisted Texas man. The first day of qualification for the 500 usually takes place two weeks before the race. Hoosier race fans in record numbers crowd into the old speedway to watch one car at a time fight the clock. On the luck of the draw, A.J. Foyt is first out, and he'd like to be the first man in history to break the 200 mile per hour barrier here. His four-lap average, 193.465, far short of expectations, but a speed guaranteed to give him an upfront starting position on race day. Next out is two-time winner Al Unser. Both he and his brother Bobby are looking for their third 500 win. The speed, just a whisker under 196 miles per hour average.
Tom Sneva goes out to win a place in his fourth Indianapolis race. The run is smooth. So smooth, it's hard to believe you've just seen history made. Two laps edged over the 200 mark. The fans go wild. Fifteen years ago, when Parnelli Jones broke the 150 mile per hour barrier, a dedicated race fan named Phil Hedbach poured 150 silver dollars into PJ's helmet. Today, he does the same thing for Tom Sneva. Only this time, there's 200 of those silver dollars. Tom Bigelow of Whitewater, Wisconsin, spins in the first turn. There's no damage, but a reminder to everyone that the difference between 200 miles per hour and a crash is a split second of timing. Foyt, back on the track again. A pressure relief valve, installed by officials on all qualifying cars, is found to be defective. And so he has another chance to make his point. This time the speed is 194.563, more than a mile an hour faster. Heat, humid heat. If you can qualify before noon, the morning coolness works for you. But in the afternoon, speeds drop three to five miles per hour. At 2 p.m., the heat is increased until a reading of the new track surface shows 120 degrees. And so, there's nothing to do but wait, and think, and plan. Or just wonder what you're doing here, in preference to, say, enjoying a tall, cold one and an ocean breeze. At 4.18 p.m., the high temperatures are down somewhat. Gordon Johncock finds his place in the field. The speed is 193.517 miles per hour. Later, Steve Krisiloff parks his racer against the southwest turn wall. He's out of the car and okay. On the track, Bobby Unser, a two-time 500 winner and many-time Pikes Peak champion. His speed climbs to 197.618. But another two-time winner is having problems. Johnny Rutherford, earlier, was running in the high 90s, but took a wave off. Now the car won't run right, and the day is almost gone. Parnelli Jones works with drag racing star Danny Angaius, who pushes his car over the 190 mile per hour mark with ease. His final record shows a four-lap average of 193.040. The day ends. Rutherford's chance to win the pole is gone. And on Sunday afternoon, Clay Regazzoni took a ride he'll never forget. Ready to go back and try again, but it won't be in that car. Day after day, the racers continue to test their reflexes and their machines. It's Jerry Grant trying to win a starting place for his 11th.
11th 500. And Al Unser, already qualified, but testing a backup car. Something fell from another car, and a second later, Al was into the wall. He limps away, lucky to be alive, and only shaken up. At 3.16 p.m. on May 21st, Larry Dixon's car looked like this. Five minutes later, it looked like this. And this is what happened in between. qualifies another Gilmore Foyt car. His speed, 186.39. Good for the race. The 1977 Indianapolis 500 saw history being made with the first 200 mile per hour lap, the first four-time winner, and now the first woman wins her starting place in the field. Janet Guthrie pushed her car to 188.403. And Tony Holman has a new problem. What do you say in place of gentlemen, start your in? On the last day of qualification, Clay Regazzoni makes the field. They say if you have an accident, you should come back and drive as soon as possible. So his therapy consisted of four laps at an average 186.047. Time runs out. The 33 starting places are filled for the 1977 Indianapolis 500. The cars are lined up for the 1977 Indianapolis 500 with Tom Sneaver on the pole. Janet Guthrie is in the race, so the two big questions are, what is Tony Holman going to say to start the engines? And number two, the question that's been going for 10 years now, can A.J. Foyt win his fourth? A lot of questions to be answered, and we'll do that right now as we drop the green flag on the 1977 Indianapolis 500.
announcer noses out Tom Sneva and moves away from the field. They're followed by Andretti, Foyt, Johncock, and Bobby Unser. Contest for first place turns into a high-pressure duel as Johncock moves up to take the lead from Al Unser. Johnny Rutherford is the first casualty out on the 12th lap. In the 14th lap, Sheldon Kinzer is out with engine failure. And Clay Regazzoni coasts in with a bad fuel leak, also out of the race. In the 15th lap, Janet Guthrie made the first of eight frustrating pit stops in an unsuccessful attempt to cure a sick engine and finish the race. The lead passed from George Snyder to Vukovic, then to A.J. Foyt. Lap 25, Eldon Rasmussen spun but stayed off the wall. in front now, followed by John Cox. It's Lloyd Ruby into the wall in turn two. Look at that again from another angle. Lloyd Ruby of Wichita Falls, Texas, a veteran of 18 Indianapolis 500-mile races. He's led the way almost every time he has entered but he's never won. Right now, the oldest driver of the race is okay, and the field is slowed until the wreckage can be cleared from the track. Mario Andretti is out after 48 laps, a broken header on his engine. Tom Sneva in for fuel on the 50th lap, is gone in 12 seconds. The field comes up to speed again. George Snyder out with a broken valve on lap 65. Foyt comes in on the 68th lap for fuel only. Bobby Unser takes over the front spot for the 69th and 70th laps. Then another engine failure. Danny Ungaius is sidelined. The heat is helping to decide the race. Bobby Unser went 94 laps. Tom Sneva took the lead for two circuits. One more top contender gone. Bill Vukovic is through for the day. Gordon Johncock leads Foyt. Or is Foyt pushing Johncock, waiting for him to break? Al Unser, Tom Bigelow, and Gary Bettenhausen, three abreast. Then Pancho Carter blows an engine, boils down the track, and Gordon Johncock right behind almost gets into the wall. Somehow, John Cock maintains his lead over Foyt, but every time he looks back, there's A.J. sitting right on his shoulder. On the 180th lap, Gordon comes in for his last stop of the race. This gives Foyt the lead for the moment, but he knows, too, that he must pit before the checkered flag. John Cock's teammate, Johnny Parsons Jr., makes his last stop of the race. He's running sixth. In the 183rd lap, Foyt slows and comes in with Al Unser right behind him. John Cock comes around, and just as Foyt starts to move, flashes by on the main street. By the time Foyt gets up to speed again, John Cock is some 15 seconds in front, and there's only 16 laps remaining in which to catch him. As it turned out, Foyt's fourth victory at Indianapolis was apparently already written in the record book of the future. He slowed down to save his engine. Tom Sneva, 35 seconds back, his only close competition.
flag. One more lap to go. And the historic checkered flag. The 61st run of the Indianapolis 500-mile speed classic is ended. Sneva, the pole setter, is second, and twice winning Al Unser adds a third to his racing achievements. A highly competitive, a self mechanic, he's a controversy old man. A tough, talking, a self designer, and a friend of all the fans. He's soon to be the only four year Along with Willie Nelson, a Wayland's outlaw band. But the king race and driving when it's Speedway country fans. This Houston Grand Prix driving champion, AJ Ford's a man. He's a race driving to Bisted, Texas man. He's number one all across the land. He's a race driving to Bisted, Texas man. Machine, a coyote scream. So Donald A.J. Foyt etches his name certainly in Speedway history by becoming the first four-time winner. He also owns another unique distinction here. He is the only person ever to win the 500 with a front engine car and a rear engine car, and he has two of each of those. And it's interesting to look at the, the way the cars have changed in design from the 1977 Coyote back to his 1961 winner, which was a very standard design for that time, uh, nicknamed the Roadster. This was an A.J. Watson design car, but not built by him. It has an Offenhauser engine, no turbocharger in front of the driver. A.J. Foyt, the winner of the 1977 Indianapolis 500. For Donald Davidson, I'm Mike King. Thanks for being with us for another edition of Indy 500, The Classics.